Ah, beautiful! You're walking with your friend and look up at the sky. The sun looks a bit different today, like it has some kind of ring around it, a rainbow type thing. Huh? Hey, look at that! Your friend pulls his head up out of his phone. You shouldn't look directly into the… Stop everything, he says. It's a sun halo. We need to find shelter now, unless you have the world's biggest umbrella on you. A sun's halo is nature's sign that there's a snow or rainstorm on its way. It's caused by clouds that are made of bazillions of small ice crystals, flying around 20,000 feet. Sunlight goes through those crystals, which causes the light to split and refract, like when there's a rainbow. Now, don't look at the sun halo directly. It's going to be tempting because it's not something you see every day. Plus, it's really beautiful. But ultraviolet light can burn the exposed tissue of your retina and cause serious damage. So, not worth it. Grab some sunglasses, and you're good to go. This phenomenon lasts about 40 minutes. These clouds are the same ones that can cause a spooky ring around the moon at night sometimes. Nature sends early signs of disasters in many ways. J-shaped trees means there's a landslide coming. Since the ground is moving slowly, the trees grow into this super selfieable shape. Try to find a flat area and avoid going near any trees, unless you have superhuman strength. You're on a nice walk on the beach. Sand, sun, not a cloud in the sky. Then, out of nowhere, you see the ocean going back away from the shore. Suddenly, you can even see bits of coral, small fish, and other random small sea animals. That's a good sign to leave. There might be a tsunami on the way. A tsunami is formed when there's an earthquake underwater, and it can hit the coast at 500 miles per hour. It's mostly a Pacific Ocean thing, but why risk it? If there's a channel of choppy water on the beach, stay away. There might be a rip current under the surface that can be extremely dangerous. Sometimes, waves hit the shore in a weird way, which forms these rip currents. You might see a strange gap in the waves. Or you might notice random bits of seaweed going in all different directions. If you don't ever find yourself caught in a rip current, try to stay afloat and don't waste your energy swimming against the current. Yell out for help and try to float your way along the beach. Once you break out of the channel, swim diagonally to the shore. If you find yourself in the ocean and see a group of sharks swimming, okay, this scenario doesn't sound good either way. Well, the good news is they're not necessarily coming for you. The bad news? The sharks might be trying to escape from a huge tropical storm or even a hurricane. Sharks can sense these things, so when nature gets angry, they group together and swim deep under the surface to get to safety. You probably shouldn't follow them. Good luck! The golden rule since ancient times, follow the animals. Insects, rats, and snakes leave their homes a couple of days before really big earthquakes. Scientists can't track or really explain how they know it's coming. It seems animals really can sense earthquakes, maybe because they feel those smaller initial shock waves that we don't even notice. What if you see animals running towards you? Well, that could mean you're about to get eaten for breakfast. Or it means there's a wildfire behind them. Amphibians like frogs, toads, and salamanders try to protect themselves by burrowing down into the ground. Others just run. Before you start running alongside them, check to see if you can see smoke. You don't want to sprint flat out for nothing. Well, it's not just animals. We can spot warning signs, too. For example, if you notice your hair suddenly starts to stand on end and your jewelry starts to buzz, take shelter right away. Lightning might be about to strike somewhere nearby. If you're outside and can't run into a house, make sure not to stand near any tall structures. Lie flat on the ground. Be near water. Seek shelter under an isolated tree or stand in an open space. And don't stand on top of the Empire State Building. That thing gets zapped hundreds of times a year. Do you like skiing? It's all fun and games until all you can see is white. Avalanches can move up to 80 miles an hour. So watch for some warning signs. Does it feel hollow when you walk in the snow? Are there cracks around your feet? Can you see a huge avalanche coming? Time to go! Sometimes a storm mixes its blue light with the red light from the sun, and you get a pretty impressive green. 
Enjoy it from a safe distance, preferably indoors. This super tall thundercloud usually means you're about to get smashed by hail, or worse, a tornado. Find cover somewhere, like in an underground parking lot or a basement. It might be a bit embarrassing if you're wrong, though. Okay, we know volcanoes can be dangerous, but the lakes near them? Is anything not a sign of danger? Lakes that are near something boiling hot that never cools, so volcanoes, are like wildly shaken soda cans just about to burst. The magma that's underground actually pushes carbon dioxide into the bottom of the lake, and that gas stays there, waiting. Then, even something boring like rain can disturb the lake a little too much and bam! Or boom! (laughs) You get the picture. Diving, swimming, snorkeling, the sea can be amazing, but it's pretty unpredictable. When two wave currents run into each other, they can create a cross sea. It looks pretty cool from far away, but it can be really dangerous for swimmers, surfers, or even ships. There's a strong current roaming around under the surface. You're walking on the beach, apparently every good story starts like this, and all of a sudden, woo, a cave! How cool is this? You should probably go in there, explore a bit, and no. If there's a full moon out, you might not be able to get out of that cave. A full moon affects the tide and makes it lower than usual. That cave might be more accessible, but instead of an exciting adventure, you could end up trapped in there until the next full moon. Bring a big lunch. A wall cloud is one of those things you're both excited and scared to see. Scared because you don't know what it is. Excited because, well, how often do you see something like that? Whatever you feel, tell your legs to start running. During a thunderstorm, these wall clouds sit lower than anything else and can be up to 5 miles long. And if they start spinning, well, Dorothy ended up in Oz. Who knows where you'll end up? It's 2009 in Italy. A man was hanging out in his kitchen. Then he saw some flickering lights. He knew just what to do. He moved his family to a safe place. A couple of seconds later, a massive earthquake hit the whole region. His family survived thanks to his quick reaction. He knew these flickering lights were actually a sign of an upcoming earthquake. People have been seeing these mysterious lights for ages. Some thought it was some kind of sign coming from space. Scientists never used to take them seriously. But after the invention of photography, more and more evidence of these strange lights appeared. Soon, they realized the connection. The lights appear, and pretty soon, the earthquake hits. After a bit of digging around, they actually found some records of these earthquake lights from hundreds of years ago. There were bluish flames coming out of the ground right before an earthquake. Ooh, creepy. Oh, ocean, come on, not you again. Okay, but just one more. If you see the oceans turned all reddish-brown, don't go in the water or anywhere near it. This red tide is caused by toxic algae and is something you can find all over the world. That toxic algae can be there even if the ocean's a normal color. Getting that stuff all over you can cause some health issues. Rinse yourself off in fresh water as fast as you can. You know, they even wrote a holiday song about it. Algae home for Christmas. No, really. Let's face it, as stars go, our sun is actually, well, pretty boring. Come on, there's nothing unusual about it. There are millions of similar yellow dwarfs in the universe. And yet, we love it. After all, it's the only star we have, and it gives us life. However, it wasn't always like that. Once upon a time, the sun had a twin, possibly an evil one. Hmm, what happened to it? Well, let's find out. Now this here is a giant molecular cloud. They're also sometimes called dark nebula. Here, there are many interstellar clumps full of gas, dust, and piles of stars. These clouds have no clear boundaries and often take weird, crazy forms. You can even see some of them with the naked eye. Look at the clear sky at night. They look like dark spots all across the bright Milky Way. And this is exactly where our sun was born about 4.5 billion years ago. The sun originated from one of these molecular clouds. Billions of years ago, waves of energy were passing by here. They collected all this material and compressed these clumps into dense nuclei. That's when a protostar was born. 
this young protostar was a ball of lukewarm hydrogen and helium. And then, millions of years later, the temperature and pressure inside the balls increased. As a result, a star was born. The Sun. But not everything in this molecular cloud has turned into the Sun. The remaining materials began to revolve around the new star. And, as you might have guessed, they gradually turned into planets, including our Earth. This is how our solar system was created. But it's quite possible that this is not the whole story, and that at the same time, along with our star, another one was born. The lost twin of the Sun, made from the same materials under the same conditions. But why do we think that it exists? Well, recently, scientists have launched some statistical models to find out more about the birth of stars. And these models have shown that many stars appear not individually, but in clusters, or at least with one sibling. After more research, scientists confirm that, yep, most stars formed inside molecular clouds are born with a companion. Sometimes these companions stay together. For example, a small star will revolve around a large one. They can even form double, triple, and other star systems. And sometimes, their paths may diverge forever. This probably happened to our Sun as well. It could have had a sibling too. Perhaps not even one, but a whole cluster of little brothers and sisters. And one bigger twin with a similar mass and other characteristics. But if that's the case, then where are you, our lost twin? Well, we have one hypothesis, and according to it, this twin may not be as good as it seems. In the 1980s, scientists began to notice a certain pattern in the Earth's history. Approximately every 27 million years, give or take, large-scale extinctions occurred on our planet. Pretty strange, right? Every 27 million years in the history of Earth, some kind of catastrophe occurred that changed its biosphere forever, as if something as scheduled cyclically caused them. Then an astronomer, Richard Muller, suggested that there may be something that caused the events, a certain celestial body. According to him, it could be a dwarf star that we can't see because of how dim it is. It could be located about one and a half light years away from us. This star rotates around the Sun in a huge orbit, and it approximately takes a whopping 27 million years for it to finish its orbit. And when it gets closest to the Sun, it starts to cause complete chaos. While approaching us, this troublemaker changes the trajectories of comets in the Oort cloud or the Kuiper belt. As a result, all these comets start to rush straight toward us. Then they crash into the Earth and cause mass extinctions, just like it was with dinosaurs. This hypothetical star was named Nemesis. It's the name of the ancient Greek deity of retribution. What is it taking revenge on us for? No idea. Perhaps it didn't like the fact that, once upon a time, the Sun took away almost all the dust and gas from a molecular cloud. The Sun became a fairly large star, but the twin remained dark and small. Moreover, in the end, it was forced to fly away in the middle of nowhere. Anyone would be annoyed by something like this. Scientists have put forward various hypotheses about what the mysterious nemesis is. Perhaps it's a brown or red dwarf. The remnants of a star that has completely depleted its fuel. Or maybe it's not a star at all, but a rogue planet more gigantic than Jupiter. Well, whatever it is, its existence isn't particularly pleasant for us. However, all our attempts to find the culprit unfortunately fail. At the moment, we still haven't found any signs of Nemesis. Recent studies have called into question the theory of regular mass extinctions. If you look more into fossil records, you'll notice that these catastrophes occurred rather randomly, rather than on a clear schedule. Now scientists doubt if Nemesis may actually exist. They also say that any star moving in a similar orbit would be very unstable, and it's very unlikely that it could have survived for that long. But despite the lack of clear evidence, Nemesis had become quite famous online. Many articles and news still mention it in different contexts. They like to write off any dramatic events taking place in the world, like asteroid falls, tsunamis, and so on, on this mysterious star. So now, all this may seem like a typical urban legend. But let's not forget about something important. Even if Nemesis itself doesn't exist, it doesn't mean that the Sun didn't have a twin. 
First of all, everything we talked about at the beginning is still relevant. Most stars aren't born alone. The probability that our Sun also had a sibling is still very high. Secondly, there may be evidence of the existence of this lost twin, and is probably somewhere in the Oort cloud. This is a huge cloud in the outer limits of our solar system. It consists of a bunch of comets and other cool rocks. Now, scientists believe that this cloud stores various remnants and fragments of everything that remained after the birth of our solar system. It's like a huge museum of our past. So, in this Oort cloud, scientists have noticed something interesting. Basically, this region seems to be too heavy. What the Oort cloud actually looks like doesn't correspond to our current models of the formation of the solar system. It's too heavy because there are some remnants of something in it. So there used to be something in the solar system that we don't know about yet. But when scientists included a possible second sun in their calculations, it fit just right. Like a missing piece of a puzzle, the lost twin perfectly matches the gap in the weight of the Oort cloud. So yeah, the sun almost certainly had a twin. But what happened to it? And where is it now? Unfortunately, this star is most likely already very far away. Probably after their birth, the Sun and daughter, <laughs> okay, Sun 2.0, spent only a couple of million years together, and then they had to separate completely. Now, the second twin may be hundreds of light years away from us. It can be anywhere in the Milky Way. And yeah, theoretically, we could find it, but that would be quite difficult. To do this, we need to find all the stars similar to our Sun, about the same age, all over the Milky Way galaxy. And even if we make a list of these stars, what's next? We have no way of knowing which one was really the twin of the Sun. So the lost twin will most likely remain lost, and our Sun will remain forever lonely. Ah, oh, what a sad story. But cheer up, for us it's probably the best. If we had two suns, perhaps the solar system would never have become what it is now. Our planet might not exist at all, and that means that there might be no life. So we probably should be grateful for the sun's sacrifice. On the other hand, our sunsets would look like the ones they have on Tatooine. Cool. Now, did you know that our sun is actually green? Okay, okay, I'm kidding. But in reality, it's all colors you can imagine at the same time. Wait, what? I know it sounds like a joke, but I'm being serious, can't you tell? In fact, our sun contains absolutely all the waves of the light spectrum. It's simultaneously red, blue, green, yellow, you name it. Where do you think rainbows come from? When sunlight gets reflected off water droplets in the air, it splits into a bunch of colored waves that we can see individually. And when they're all together, we see a white ray of light. Our eyes are unable to perceive the concept of all colors at the same time, so their combination seems white to us. Wait, you might say, why white? Isn't the sun yellow? Yep, it's yellow too, but please don't stare at the sun just to make sure. It appears white when we see it from the International Space Station. This is the sun's real color as our eyes perceive it. The sun gets a yellowish hue when its rays get scattered in Earth's atmosphere. Our atmosphere doesn't let the blue rays of the spectrum pass very well, but the red ones? Hey, sure, why not? By the way, that's why the sky seems blue to us. The atmosphere scatters the blue color all over the place. During sunrise and sunset, short blue waves get reflected but the long red ones reach us perfectly. That's why we see sunsets as pink, orange, or red. But what would happen if the sun had a different color? To answer this question, let's quickly repeat what we've learned. 1. The sun has the whole color spectrum in it. 2. Our atmosphere is like blue rays? No. Nope. Red rays? Anytime. So you probably already guessed what would happen if the sun was, let's say, red. The whole world would look like it does during sunsets. Not bad, huh? We wouldn't even have to wait for the evening to admire the scarlet sky. Orange water and a bright red moon. Yeah, it would be darker than what we're used to, but still not bad. Oh, by the way, one day, the sun will actually turn red. When its life comes to an end, it will expand and gradually turn into a red giant before finally burning out. But uh, it's not going to be so much fun for us. So let's hope we won't be around to see that moment. 
I know I won't. Hey, I've got a party to go to. Okay, now, what if the sun was green? Well, the truth is, the sun is green. So, here's your dialogue. Wait, are you kidding me? Didn't you just say that it's white? Ooh, good job on that, by the way. Well, not exactly, bud. The sun just looks white. But technically, it has a temperature of around 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And the pink wavelength of the sun's spectrum corresponds to the green-blue hue. But to make sure that the sun is green, we need to drown out the rest of the visible spectrum. Then our atmosphere will let through a pure green color. And what'll happen then? Well, everything will be green. And everything will also be a bit darker. Well, face it, it's not easy being green. Okay, moving on. Now let's paint the sun blue. Blue stars actually do exist. They're called blue giants. Fortunately, our sun is not one of them. Why fortunately? Well, because if it was a blue giant, it would be a young, beautiful, unimaginably large, and very, very hot star. See, our red is hot, blue is cold logic doesn't apply to stars. The hottest stars are white and blue, and the coldest are yellow and red. Yeah, our sun is actually very cold compared to other stars. Now, take the average temperature in your city, but multiply it like by hundreds of thousands. Yeah, we're struggling with global warming here, but global burning? Eh, no thanks, blue giants. Anyway, let's imagine that the sun turned blue. How would we see the world? Surprisingly, nothing would change. Remember how I said that the atmosphere scatters blue light? That's why, in this case, everything would remain almost the same. Maybe the sky would get bluer, but we wouldn't see much difference. And finally, the darkest, pun intended, option. What if our sun turned black? Stock up on lamps and candles, because there is no more light. People use electricity all over the world 24-7. We also can't see the moon anymore. After all, we can observe it these days only because the sun's rays get reflected off of it. Now, the only thing we still have to illuminate our nights are stars, but they don't help us much. Good thing this scenario is totally unrealistic and there are no black stars, right? Well, yeah, there are no black stars. And still, our sun will eventually become completely black one day. And I don't mean a black hole. I'm talking about black dwarfs here. You've probably heard of white dwarfs. Maybe even seven dwarfs. When a star like our sun is about to finish its life, it expands and turns into a red giant. And then, gradually losing its upper layers, it turns into white dwarfs. Since they no longer produce fuel, they slowly cool down. All that remains is a small core, living out its life and burning bright. And when the star cools down completely, right, it turns into a black dwarf. But you've probably never heard of them. Why? Because, surprise, surprise, they don't exist. And no, I was not lying. The thing is, a star needs about one quadrillion years to turn into a black dwarf. And our universe is still a baby. It's only about 14 billion years old. So no star has reached this stage yet. Even the most ancient of them still emit a little light. That's why black stars are just a theory. And it's unlikely that we'll ever see such a star at all. But remember the famous saying, the stars that we see at night are already ghosts because their light has reached us only now. Well, that's a myth. They're all still alive. Why am I telling you all this? Well, let's imagine that our sun turned into a black dwarf. The entire solar system would immediately get plunged into absolute darkness. It would also be terribly cold. The moon would leave its orbit and crash into Earth. Wait, no. Let's overlook this moment and assume we're still alive. Fortunately, we wouldn't freeze instantly, as you might think. Earth's core has its own temperature, more than 9,000 degrees. But the temperatures on the surface of the planet would still immediately drop to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. The core would gradually cool down. Every two months, its temperature would drop by two times. In just two months, Earth's surface temperature would be minus 190 degrees, and in a year, it would reach minus 450 degrees. Most plants would disappear pretty quickly, not because of the cold, but because of the lack of photosynthesis. Others would live a little longer thanks to the oxygen still remaining in the atmosphere. And, oddly enough, trees would survive for a very long time. They have a slow metabolism and get sugar from the ground. The upper layer of the oceans would freeze very quickly. Fortunately, this thick crust of ice would insulate deep waters, so the entire ocean wouldn't freeze for some time. Marine creatures would be doing pretty well. 
They existed long before us and are already used to crazy temperature changes, the lack of oxygen and food, huge pressures, and other joys of deep-sea life. And what about us humans? Well, first of all, we'd start getting sick. Without vitamin D, people would face a huge number of different health problems. Also, our bodies need sunlight to produce melatonin. This melatonin helps us understand when we should go to bed and wake up. If people didn't have this hormone, their bodies would get very confused and wouldn't understand whether they needed to sleep or not. That would mean insomnia for many people. But we would still be able to survive. We'd have two options to build giant submarines and go down into the depths of the ocean closer to Earth's core, or stay on the surface, living our lives in some location where we'd have sources of geothermal energy. In Iceland, for example. We could also settle near volcanoes. Their heat would be enough to warm us for a long time. Our vision would adapt to the dark, but at some point, it would reach its maximum. So we'd need to get used to living in complete darkness. But who knows? Maybe we would adapt to this life, too. So, which option would you prefer? Living at the bottom of the ocean in a submarine or on the surface near volcanoes? <laughs>